Okay, we're back. We're doing some magnetism. And I first want to just do a very, very quick review of, of kind of where we're at, um, but then focus on something that's called a current density, and in particular, a non-uniform current density. We've mentioned these briefly in class, but um, we, we now want to get some more detail to this. It's going to be very analogous to Gauss's law and charge densities. Um, we tried to build magnetism up kind of in parallel with how we did Gauss's law in electric fields and all that before. And we figured out that uh, magnetism is a little bit different because it's created by moving electric charges. Uh, we've been using two different rules, Ampere's law and Biot-Savart, in order to figure out the actual magnetic fields being created by currents and moving charges. Um, we've also hit things like once you have these magnetic fields and they produce forces on moving charges, we have these cross products. Uh, we, we, we've got on a single charge QB cross B, we've got it on wire with current IL cross B. And we've been using our right hand rules for positive charges, we've been using left hand rules for negative charges, and so on. With Ampere's law, it's, it's a lot like Gauss. Um, it kind of looked like Gauss. We use it for only three cases, like Gauss's law and those were the toroid, straight wires, and, and solenoids. But the straight wires and solenoids we approximated by making them long and not worrying about ends. It depends on the current inside a particular region, kind of like you know, Gauss's law depends on charge inside a certain region. And with these three cases, we really didn't have to do much in the way of calculus. Um, the the so-called path integrals reduced down to something nice and neat. Once we get beyond those three shapes, Again, like Gauss's law, it gets tougher. We, we actually do have to do integrals. And that's where this Biot-Savart rule comes into play. And that's what we use for every other shape. And those will give us supposedly exact answers if, if we're able to do the math. OK, so uh, as we did with Gauss's law, we built all this up. And then we finally got into the worst case scenario for Gauss, which is the non-uniform densities. And we knew that we, we had to do an extra, lev or, um, an extra level of integration to find the charge once we knew what the function was of the charge density. That's going to be kind of the case here for Ampere's law. The worst case scenario for Ampere's law is this thing called a non-uniform current density. So let's just define these things first, and then we'll do two examples, uh, one with a, a constant density and one with a non-constant um, or non-uniform current density. The current density is simply defined as the amount of current, okay, the number of amps, you have flowing through the cross-sectional area of a wire. And wires are usually circular uh, as far as the cross-section goes. So here's something, here's a little picture, and we'll assume that we have a, a constant uniform current density for a long wire. Okay, so our current density would be defined as the total current divided by the cross-sectional area that it flows through, which is pi big R squared in this case. Okay, and that's just, that just represents this cross-section uh, that the flow is taking place. And so based on this definition, and in this case if it's a a uniform um, current flow. This will just be some number. Okay, it'll be a constant. And we can find the current flowing through any portion of, of that wire uh, simply by taking the uh, current density and multiplying it by whatever cross-sectional area we have. Okay, so if we're trying to find the magnetic field inside this particular wire, uh, if I go ahead and if I draw in a little dashed line at a certain smaller radius, and that'll be our little r. It's not so bad with Ampere's law. Okay, um, the length of the path is 2 pi r. It's a circulating magnetic field. Okay, so that's the left-hand side of Ampere's law. On the right-hand side, we have our mu. Okay, this magnetic constant times the current inside. Okay, flowing through that circular region. And using our our current density value, that current inside of that smaller circle is the density multiplied by pi little r squared. Pi little r squared is the cross-sectional area that we're interested in. And so we could go ahead and we could, we could solve for the magnetic field inside the wire. Um, things will uh, simplify a little bit. The pi is going to drop out. 
uh, one of the little r's is going to drop out. And so we're going to have mu times j times uh, a little r on top all over 2. If we wanted to, we could substitute in um, our definition for j for its current density. And so we'd have mu times the current times little r on top. And then we'd have 2 pi big R squared in our denominator. And so the magnetic field would be uh, linear with radius. Okay, there's no magnetism right at the center of the wire because of symmetry. If we were to plot the magnetic field as a function of radius, and here's the, the full radius of the wire. It's going to be linear inside. And then 1 over R on the outside, like we found before with Ampere's law. Okay, so yeah, not too bad. Uh, if it's uniform, there's no calculus. Um, it reduces down pretty nicely. We get a relatively simple answer, and it's, it's going to be uh, linearly proportional to the radius. Okay, so we've seen things like this in class. Let's go to the worst case. It's the same thinking as, as what we had back in the days of Gauss's law with electric fields. Okay, in the, in the past we, we had rho, we had a non-uniform charge density, and that might be some function. And what that meant is an extra layer of, of calculus. We had to do some integration to find out what the plug-in for the charge back into Gauss's law. Okay, it's going to be very similar here if we have a non-uniform current density. So maybe we're given some weird function, kind of like this up here. Um, well, in a very similar way, there's one layer of integration that we have to do to find the current flowing through the wire. And that's this, this density function, okay, the current density function multiplied by some little area. So the question becomes, what's this little dA thing, this element of area? Well, it's got to be a cross-sectional area because we're talking about the flow of the current going through the area. But the trouble is the density, the, the current density, has a particular value as a function of radius. Okay, so the way we can think about this is if we if we think of our little Amperian loop, okay, if, if we go a certain radius out from the center of the wire, okay, that really kind of uh, we, we have to imagine this as a really thin little cylindrical shell. Okay, if I extend it back, it's... And we have to ask, how much is flowing through the cross-sectional area of that little shell? Now, the shell is really, really skinny. It has a tiny little thickness to it that we can call dr. So think about what would the, what would the cross-sectional area of that thin little hollow shell, that cylindrical shell, be? Well... If we think of the circumference of the shell multiplied by the thickness of the shell, that would be area. Okay. Um, or think about if, if we were to take that shell and slice it up, like, like slice it somewhere and stretch it out into a straight line, 2 pi r would be the length and dr would be the, the width. And that would be the area that you'd be, you'd be going through. Okay, so what that means is to find the current inside this little dashed region that we have, we have to go little hollow shell after little hollow shell after little hollow shell. Just add all of those up with all these different densities at each radius. Okay, that's what the integral does. So we've, we've got our function, 2 times a, which is a constant, times r times our dA, which is circumference times that little skinny thickness. Okay, and we're going to integrate that uh, if we want to find the magnetic field inside the wire from zero to little r. Okay, so this integration we can do, um, pull out constants, four times pi times a, and what we're left with is little r squared dr. Okay, well, that'll, that'll pop out. Uh, let's see, the, that antiderivative is, is one-third r cubed. So 
we get 4 thirds pi a little r cubed. And that, that's going to be the current inside of that Amperian loop that we're after. Okay, going through that cross-sectional area. So Ampere's law tells us to find the magnetic field. Whoops, it's an ugly two. <laughs> The left-hand side is always the same. It's a circular path that the magnetism is going to follow, so 2 pi r. We've got our constant times the current inside of the region we want. And this integral, we just figured out what the current is. 4 thirds pi, that constant a times little r cubed. We can solve for the magnetic field. Okay, a factor of 2 pi drops out. One of the little r's goes away. And what we're left with is mu. Uh, we have 2 times a times little r squared. That's all over 3. Okay. We can get the direction that the magnetic field circulates by our curly right hand rule. If the current's moving to the right, then on this picture, the magnetic fields are going around clockwise, okay, around the wire, both whether it's outside or inside the wire. Okay, so all these, these uh, current densities do, that they're non-uniform, is if we think of the graph, they're just going to kind of play with it inside, depending on the function. In this case, magnetic field increases as r squared, and on the outside, it's going to decrease as 1 over r. Okay, so have the strongest magnetism right at the surface, and the, these current densities only affect what happens inside of the wire. Okay, we don't care about, once we go outside the wire, then you have the total current. There is no difference with the current densities. It doesn't make it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. I hope you can kind of get a sense of what the parallel is and the analogy is to Gauss's law when we were doing those non-uniform charge densities. The same kind of deal with the current densities, only we have area instead of volume. Okay, so I hope these examples help, and until next time, we'll see you later.